me start with the, the today's lecture. We are continuing with this discussion on waste generation, waste forms and definition of the waste which I have done followed by uh, the types of the waste which I have done and there we were discussing about in detail municipal waste and industrial non-hazardous waste. So the question is how we are going to dispose of industrial and non-hazardous waste. This is a big challenge right now. Most of the industries are asking for your help and what I see is that many of them are clueless. I want to give you an exercise here. I am thinking of calling most of the major industries in India and for that I need a questionnaire. The idea is through MP, you know, MOEFCC and Ministry of Environment. I am trying to create a discussion session where most of the industries will be participating mandatorily and I am going to ask them a question that what do you do with your industrial waste. This is a very sensitive issue. They may disclose, they may not disclose. The second question is uh, how do you handle, manage and dispose and if you are clueless in what way you need help from the academia. So as I said uh, not many answers are available particularly when you ask this question how to dispose the industrial non hazardous waste and that is the reason you find there is a lot of chaos and disorder in the society and everything is being disposed of wherever people get place. Incidentally sometimes magics happen you know the road which is connecting Kanjurmark to Eastern Express Highway. That road was created by dumping debris which are coming out of the power area as an experimental basis I was a part of this exercise that was long back in 1998-99 and from that state you see now it has become a big highway. It has taken about 18-20 years for this state of highway to occur. So that was a beautiful analogy of how disposal of the waste should be done which is of industrial non-hazardous type because construction has become an industry alright. So construction is not MSW please remember this thing there is a fine difference. So when we call talk about the industrial non-hazardous waste this could be one of the applications you can reclaim the land. Biggest question is cost amount of or the volumes which are required. So there was a time when I wanted to collect all the CND waste of the city and transport it up to the Navi Mumbai International Airport. Massive reclamation is going on there and then I wanted to dump it in a scientific manner. So this is one example. The second example would be the two projects which I did at Bombay Port Trust MBPT. This is what is known as Indira Container Terminal now ICT where there were two um, dockyards, dry docks you must be aware of where the ships are repaired. These are the garages for the ships. So these are known as dry docks. So they bring them inside the dock area, they take out the water from the ponds or the dry docks and then they repair the ship, open the gate, water comes from the sea, again you float it back. It is a very interesting exercise. So this was done long back by using most of the construction debris of the city at that time about 7-8 years back. So these are the practical applications. Some of you who are interested in knowing how these things can be done. Unfortunately, there is no dedicated group which takes up these exercises. So most of the time they come back to the academicians to help them out. Though I think that this can become a very interesting uh, you know career for many of you or some of you definitely. So when you talk about disposal, uh, unfortunately everything is being disposed of on the land. It's unfortunate but then we are a poor nation or not financially. Roadmap is one, correct. 
there is no understanding, you know this ignorance, there is no understanding, it is not that we do not have money, we have money. Unfortunately, we are not using the concepts, technical issues properly to dispose the material on the land itself. So, whatever you are finding litter here and there is just because of it is all everybody's land. So, there was a time when MSW of Bombay city used to go up to you know Thana Fata, you cross Thana and then dump it on the way to Nasik. Now, that portion has become MIDC industrialized. Now, they are not allowing you to dump over in anything there. So, truly speaking MSW is now becoming a big issue where to dump it. So, these type of issues are becoming very interesting to deal with. Somebody in the previous lecture was talking about the ocean disposal. Yeah, so this was done long back. Now, you cannot do it because there are environmental watchdogs and they do not allow you to do this. And particularly, you cannot even discharge the hot water which comes out of the turbines or different industrial processes in uh, you know oceans. So, let me give you some examples. Now, just to give you an example of how things are happening, you see this is the place where most of the activity is happening and if you are reading newspaper these days, government of Maharashtra is trying to convert this whole area into a marina, all right. So, this is going to be a beautiful example of how offshore engineering can be done in the cities or the coastal areas. Now, what I was talking about is this is the Victoria docks and this is the Indira docks, fine. And what they do is these are the gates from where the ships enter and they control it. There is a sea wall which they construct over here. And these are basically dry docks which were done by Britishers long, long back. So, this was one, my, one of my consulting projects. Now, whole area is being converted into a container terminal and container terminals are developed to enhance the export import of your country. So, this whole area which was earlier a seaport is now being converted into a sort of a reclaimed land, huge land it is. Uh, the dimension of this would be about 3 kilometers by 1 kilometer and the depth of water here is about 8 and half meters. So, huge volumes are there, fine. And similarly, this also is approximately same 3 kilometer by 800 meters, 8 and, eight and a half meter deep. So, this was an interesting project where I tried to utilize most of the uh, construction debris which are coming out of the South Bombay region as a man made soil to reclaim this. The second thing is that I was talking about is uh, ocean disposal. I do not know how many of you have been to Dhanu. So, I have been talking to you about uh, the waste water which is coming out of the industrial units, it cannot be dumped directly in the river bodies or the water bodies. So, this is a beautiful example. It is a huge thermal power plant and what you see here is the recourse channel. So, what they do is they take water from the offshore for running their turbines and any guess what this structure is? See, this is the main creek, all right and this is the Dhanu power plant. So, my question to you is the intake of water for running the plant is taken from here, this is the intake structure and this supplies water to the thermal power plant. Now, what is this structure? Any idea? It is related to you cannot dispose directly anything into the water body. So, it is probably an artificial waterway they have created with like Larger surface area, so water cools down by the time it reaches. Very the good, you are right, absolutely correct. So, why do they create this? What is the harm in the way you are intaking water? You can dump water back there. What will happen? 
still hot thermal pollution time to cool is number 1 so basically these are cooling channels fine because the water which is going to come out of the turbine and the plant is going to be at very high temperature now if you dump it directly into the creek aquatic life will get disturbed and this against the environmental norms second thing is you might be having a lot of contaminants which are coming out of the industry so you know open discharge is not possible so what you have to do is you have to first put it in a retention channel treat it over here and then put it down into the creek so this is another example of what i have been talking about uh, this part is ocean ocean disposal now many years back what people used to do is they used to dump everything by encasing them into concrete technical word is encapsulation so encapsulation is the term which is normally used for immobilizing the waste which are highly toxic clear so what you should do is take the waste matrix put it in a container and then immobilize it by dipping it into a concrete so entire thing will freeze and nothing will come out of this unit and these units they used to dump into the water bodies encapsulation so the more and more toxic waste you are producing this practice seems to be good but you have to be extremely careful you have to do several tests to find out what is leaching out of it and i am sure you must be aware of what is leaching so you have to put this system in the water acidulated water by changing ph and see what comes out of it what type of activity is coming out of it if it is radioactive what type of chemicals are going to come out of it what is the durability number one question because if you are going to dump all these things into the sea water clear which is highly saline what is going to happen the durability of the concrete is going to get affected so this opens up a very big research area in civil engineering and material sciences i hope you can understand first of all you have to select the material right material in which you can capsulate the waste which is going to be durable clear otherwise what will happen it will simply get corroded in the due course of time and all the activity will come out into the water and then you will be in trouble so this is ocean disposal or let's say water body disposal people used to do the same thing in the lakes people used to do the same thing in the wells and this is dangerous this is banned completely it is illegal it's very difficult to monitor it so monitoring is the main problem and selecting the right minerals and who is going to spend so much money for immobilization is another issue atomic waste cannot be disposed like this so that part is different we'll talk about this later all right so check it out on net encapsulation and many times we use the word immobilization is it not so you have immobilized the waste it cannot come out of this matrix you can use cementitious materials you can use different type of uh, polymers which are going to create most impervious system fine so need of the hour is to create systems like this impervious concrete and that too when it comes in contact with highly corrosive aggressive environment fine a lot of research is required here see the problem is aquatic life also has right to live so there are ngos please understand gone are the days when you used to dump everything in the river bodies or maybe water bodies or lakes clear now ngos are there what is their job so you will be in trouble you cannot take this risk i think i was talking about the disposal of waste in orbits so what they used to do is they used to put everything particularly radioactivity in different type of rockets and they used to put it in the outer sphere this is also banned now because one day it is going to fall and the day it falls is going to be a rain of radioactivity anyway so incineration is another way of disposal of industrial non hazardous waste the basic motive behind incineration is i want to get rid of the volumes and the moisture but then it creates secondary problems and the secondary problems are in terms of the ash which we are producing there all the toxicity gets transmitted into the residues we call them as combustion residues 
Now the question is, this is a very concentrated system and what should I do with this? So a few years back, the philosophy was put everything in the concrete. Now concrete technologies have really raised a big question about this. They say our concrete is not a dump yard where you dump everything into it because concrete requires some traits, some parameters. So this is also a closed option now. Otherwise the idea was whatever ash comes out of incineration of hazardous waste, you put it in concrete. Leachability is a big question and hence this process also gets defeated. Seaver disposal, whenever you get time, please go and visit the seaver <coughs> disposal procedure which MCGM follows very close to Dadar. The amount of biosolids they produce, it is a big concern what to do with the biosolids. So some of you who might like to research in this area, write it down this topic biosolids. In India nobody is working on this right now, but this is a very big topic of you know interest. Australians are champion in this and if you see the photographs on the net, you will realize that this is an alarming situation. What will be the attributes of the biosolids which I am over emphasizing? So what is that I am trying to convey? Why biosolids are becoming a threat to the society? I hope you understand what are biosolids. Sievers, sewages, clear? When you process it, whatever sediments remain there, these are biosolids. You have to take them out and then treat them. So what, what is the issue involved with this? So this is the best word, see this is not a, not a technical term. So he said bacteria, what is the cousin brother of bacteria? Pathogens, clear. So what you are doing, you are storing pathogen and bacteria just like a time bomb. So that is the reason their handling of biosolids is now becoming a part of environmental geotechnics. Though it was supposed to be a purely environmental engineer's point of view or maybe practice, but they say we do not build the sediments. So these sediments are going to be having high concentrations of pathogens and bacteria. Now what should I do? A virus also. It will be having all these things, it will be having, having fungus, okay. So what should I do is the question, you measure parameters, you do the analysis in the lab, ultimately the question is what you are going to do with it, yes, bacteriophages, bacteriophages I have no idea, please explain it to me. Those are the viruses that feed on bacteria. Those who feed on bacteria. Yeah, so okay. like before dumping them, uh, like uh, there are many rivers that have these bacteriophages. So you can annihilate them by using this tree. Yes, yes. Very yes. good. So, so this is one of the ways, yeah. at such a large scale where should I store them number one? Type on your mobile phones and see biosolids, see the magnitude of the problem, alright. It is not going to be few tons, it is going to be huge amount and if you say there is a solution, commercially it has to be viable. Number two, the volumes which are going to be treated, so two issues are very important. develop your own company and handle this. The people are clueless, understand? And then whatever residues come out of the biosolids, use them for some other applications. That is why life sciences has become an integral part of civil engineering now. And what we are finding is we have, we have handicap, you know, we have never studied life sciences, biotechnology and all these things. But now the need of the hour is you should master it, otherwise you cannot give a solution. You should have laboratories in civilian department to tackle these type of situations which we do not have. Septic tanks also same story, lagoons and surface impoundments I have talked about in the previous lecture if you remember, you know, uh, lagoons are the ones where you store waste water or sewage. So you create a big area where you allow retention for certain time, sedimentation takes place, water clean up and then you recirculate the water and whatever sediments remain there, you have to consume them, you have to desilt the lagoons, otherwise the retention capacity will decrease. 
So, most of the ash ponds which are an integral part of the thermal power plants, they have this problem. I mean, gone are the days when land was in abundance, all right. So, if you see these are the ash ponds, imagine, look at this. It is a good experience to go and visit the site. So, this much of the ash is being produced by the DTPS, Dhanu Thermal Power Plant, only one plant in the country. Like this, there are so many. India produces about 150 million tons of fly ash every year. Agreed? So, this is what is happening here. Look at this. These are known as lagoons, sur surface impoundment. You just dump the material and this much of the land is totally unusable for any applications. Though efforts have been made in the past to reclaim these lands also for construction. But I hope some of you will realize those who have good concepts in geotechnical engineering. This bottom ash or the fly ash which is being deposited over here is very loose and hence it is liquefiable. You understand the word liquefi liquefaction of the material? So, whenever earthquake comes, the system may get shaken up and then it may lose its strength. So, this again is a very big question. Another big challenge in today's society is land is becoming scarce which most of you know. If I have to run this plant, thermal power plant, incineration of coal will be done and the same amount of ash is going to come out. So, power plant can be run only when I have a strategy to store the fly ash or the bottom ash, clear. Now, if you do not have the facility to store this material the byproduct or the waste which is coming out of industry, you have to stop production of electricity itself. Are you realizing the matrix which I have created? So, that is the reason existence of most of the industries is under question mark. Why? Because we do not have a right disposal strategy. Is this part clear? So, this is a very big theme, very big subject. And this is case specific. So, one of the issues I will discuss which I want to discuss in the previous class today. Is this correct? Anything else which comes to your mind? Now, the questions are how to utilize this material, what could be the application, where to sell it, where to gift it, where to dispose it, how to enhance the capacity, for how many years and so on. Another good example of surface disposal in which I am involved with is if you say A beautiful example of you know how the hazardous material which might be toxic even. Look at this. Can you make out something? Indalco is famous for what? Aluminum. Clear? Alumina. Fine. So, whenever you get time, please visit their factory. It is very close to Ranchi place called Muri. Now, this side is the disposal pond and this is the industry. So, the situation is like this that each ton of bauxite which you are using, when you treat it to form alumina, you produce exactly same amount of red mud and this is the red mud. Red mud is famous for its basicity, caustic. So, the pH of this material would be about 12.5, 13. Understand? Now, if you see it in the 3D, you will realize that this height of this pond is almost 45 meter, 50 meter. And now I am helping them to increase the retention capacity. So, it is like creating Himalayas in the central India, because there is no other way. Villagers are so intelligent that they do not want to give even a square inch of land at throwaway price. So, the cost of the land is so high here that you cannot imagine, because everybody knows that they have no other answer except for shelling out money at big price. And look at this, there is a river, this is what is known as Subandrekha river. 
across on the right hand side this is west bengal and left hand side is jharkhand so problems are multifarious all right now how would you design the retention scheme for this what how much life of the plant can be extended because of this is geotechnics environmental geotechnics so more than this you have to sit down and design and then learn yourself but concepts are i am giving you the concepts construction applications can you use this material for construction applications like certain fraction of red mud is being sent to uh, cement plants because it has alumina it has iron and these are two constituents which you require for making cement about certain fraction is being used by these guys but again the deterrent is more caustic which it has so all these processes are very expensive so my two student uh, one student is working in this area ganraj so he is doing lot of experiments there to neutralize this material and convert it into man made soil and what not and this is where we are also working on this material by uh, using bacterial activity if we can neutralize this material there is something known as acid producing bacteria what you have in your stomach gut so why do you have acidity take out that and put insert it here so what it will do it will produce more and more acid and it will neutralize the high ph value of the dump something of this sort we are trying to work on and the resource recovery so different applications you can think of where you can extract the precious metals one of the precious metals which is present in red mud is vanadium you know this and see this is where again sustainability concept comes i am not the right person to talk about it but i am just giving an idea so you have to sit down with chemistry guys chemical engineers metallurgist and then devise a technique where you take this material industry will be very happy to give you free of cost and you devise a technology so that you can extract the vanadium out of it you need not to do mining remember you are doing sustainable solution you know you are not damaging the nature further and then utilizing the material which has already come out of it and then giving it a value added shape this is part clear so application sustainability lot of thing we are talking about now engineering management society and environment is this part okay any suggestion what comes to your mind you you talked about chemistry guys like uh, material so i i, ha Material I know the metallurgy know example yes. like uh, there was a uh, there is a earth industries in vapi so there is another industry like near the uh, earth industries and they made some uh, like they make some chemicals and the by product was was like uh, is like lots of chlorine so they uh, they like they gave uh, all the chlorines free to the earth industries like very good so it's a synergy between industries we were discussing when you were not here in last two lectures we have talked about all these issues marrying two industrial waste to create something interesting all right this is the philosophy right now match making which is going on okay anything else awesome. yeah but it's a good solution yes fine so uh there are several things which you can do in terms of r&d in terms of applications in terms of planning which until now people have not done and that's one of the reasons people like me are so loaded overloaded we don't have any time every day we travel every day there are so many projects to do I mean, life has become miserable you can't believe seriously and at this age if you have to go and climb up on this red mud pond is not a good syndrome you know <laughs> you should not be so enthusiastic to climb because why why i am telling you this you can't walk you slip it's a soil which has lot of caustic in it so the chances are that you will slip and you will fall down so i go very frequently because i do environment audit audit of for the entire area so think of you know these are very challenging ideas people who say that there is no work and geotechnical and civil engineering has no future in scope i mean my idea or my message for them is you do not know what's happening in the world 
So, coming back to hazardous waste, a very interesting topic to work on. Uh, people take help of US EPA guidelines. All of you are aware of what is US EPA. There is a beautiful website, epa.gov, and then US Environmental Protection Agency. Most of the norms which we have followed are from US EPA only. Sometimes, whenever you get time, please go through the gadget of India and try to understand how minutely and detailed description of the entire hazardous waste is given there. Clear? Yeah? And so much in lens that nobody reads it. So, major source of hazardous waste is industrial activity. Nowadays, the big question is what is an industry and what is not an industry? What about Dharavi? See, Dharavi is located right in the central part of Bombay, in the heart of the Bombay city. Now, the type of waste which is going to come out of it, what it is? Hazardous, non hazardous, industrial. Dharavi is famous for industrial activities. You know? Most of the industries are operating from there. Now, imagine whatever is being disposed of in Mithi River. And we did a complete audit of Mithi River and we have submitted a report. So, these are the issues. So, the first question in my mind is that how would you define industrial and non-industrial activity in today's world? That itself is a big question. So, this poses significant threat to the environment health in combination with other materials or alone. These are the four types. I think you were talking about this in the last lecture. So, as per EPA 1980, there are four types of hazardous waste, aqueous inorganic, aqueous organic, organic and then hazardous sludges and sludges whatever are coming out of the different type of industries. So, wherever you have industries, these type of things are going to happen. Now, this is what we were discussing some time back, the hazard associated with the waste is not only due to its presence, but also due to its concentration. This is the difference between the toxicity and hazardicity. This we have already discussed, you know, when you dilute things, it becomes, it comes back from toxicity towards hazardicity. But the question is large volumes, you cannot handle easily. Otherwise, the best solution is you take enough amount of water, provided it was there. The water itself is a big scarcity. And then you interact with the waste, form a slurry and then take it wherever you want to. So, this is what I say that as such detection of a hazardous material in the ground does not necessarily indicate a significant problem. We can live with hazardicity, but we cannot live with the toxicity. Let us have a quick view on the list of the hazardous waste which is coming out of different sources. Nuclear power plants is one which we have discussed quite a lot last in the last lecture also I think you were talking about the volume versus toxicity, nuclear waste versus. So, nuclear power plants produce lot of hazardous material. We should not say toxic because uh, that depends upon leachability of the material. Landfills, everybody is aware of the leachates which are coming out are hazardous in nature. They could be toxic also. The gases which are coming out of it are indicating towards hazardicity. Chemical industries and metal forming industries, they are the source of hazardous material. So, whatever sludges come out of electroplating units, in the previous to previous lecture we were talking about uh, this thing, transformer oil, automobiles oil and so on. Electroplating is a industry which is basically source of hazardous material. So, the question is that uh, what should be done? Should I ban all these industries, start importing everything from outside or what is the solution then? Another big problem is that uh, being not a very rich nation, industries are not very rich. So, their economics gets governed by the cost benefit ratio and what they are disposing of. And there is no will to take care of the waste, whatever they are producing because of this ratio getting distorted. 
So one of you has written this in your PPT <coughs> that this should be done and industry should be forced to do all these things. But the question is how this will be done? Who is going to force it to happen? Paint and dye manufacturing industries. I mean these are another culprit all of you are aware of. Sanganer was a place where Supreme Court had to intervene. You must be aware of. They had to evacuate all these uh, dye industry and uh, this tapa print which is very famous there. They had to ask them to close their business. So there is a social impact of that. Why? Because all this used to leach into the groundwater and hence most of the part of the western India has heavily contaminated water. Unfortunately, the soil is also pervious. Had it been Bombay, there is no problem. But because you have a pervious material through which the contaminants migrate, the groundwaters are quite contaminated. I am very happy to know that many of you have picked up this PRB concept. <laughs> so, a lot of you, many of you have written about PRB, permeable reactive barriers. That is a very good solution, but then you have to understand how to implement it. So, it seems that there is a misconception about application of PRB. Yeah, but good beginning. You should read more and more about PRB. So, to come out of most of these situations, PRB is a good idea. But my question is how are you going to force the stream of water to flow through it, which is underground. So, that means you have to do underground channelization of groundwater, which itself is going to be a big engineering. But yes, if you can do that, it would be perfect. So, this is what the technology is, you have to develop this technology. Otherwise, you have to buy these technologies from different countries, which they will not give you. So, need of the hour is people like you should sit down and form teams, groups, companies and provide solution. We were in the research mode, but then somebody has to be in application mode, otherwise the entire nation will be doing only research. What do you say? Is this correct? Mining industries, mine, acid mine drainage we have talked about, most of the mining waste which is being disposed, contained near the mines. Uh, one of you has talked about social issues of mining, it is good. Somebody has talked about social issues related to mining. But then this is very superficial, there are much more you know intense things into it. So, how would you take this land first of all in your possession, start mining over there, you have to plan the mining activities and you have to preserve the environment against contamination. I think I gave you this example of uh, uranium tailings, Jarsaguda is the famous example, check it, read it on net, Jarsaguda mines, J A R Jarsaguda, Jarsaguda mines in Orissa, Jarsaguda is in Orissa. Jadu Guda is in Jharkhand. So, Jadu Guda and Jharsa Guda. So, these are the places where most of the box is this thing, uranium mining is being done. And once you do uranium mine, you just type on the net uranium mines in India, it will take you directly to that place. So, the more and more you process, the more and more tailings are left behind. And now the question is what to do with the displaced populace? And ultimately, all this water seeps through into the ground and contaminates your water table and soil. Clear? Paper and pulp industry. I think we have discussed about this some time back that when you process paper, a lot of silt gets generated. And the question is what to do with the silt? So, if you characterize this material, you will realize this normal silt what you get in different parts of the country. And then you have to think of an application that can it be used for making road embankments, foundation pads, retaining walls and so on, fine. But please remember when you produce paper, there is a lot of contamination associated with this, why? I think we discussed this in the class. You do acid wash quite frequently and cellulose itself is a contaminant, it does not 
degrade. Why? Why it is not decomposable? A structure is like this. These are basically a sort of a carbohydrates, which cannot be easily digested by you even. See, many human beings cannot digest all sorts of hydrocarbons, sorry, uh, carbohydrates, is it not? You have allergy, gluten, this, that, what not. So, you cannot digest it so easily. So, this is a big question. Most of the landfills contain cellulose, which cannot be decomposed. So, who was talking about this decomposition and that is the reason. Cellulose cannot be digested, destroyed so easily. Find out a solution, how to decompose it, fine. Arif is doing some experiments in my lab and at Kanjur Mark landfill. So, we are trying to study the decomposability of the MSW fractions. That is a very interesting research area and we are trying to see how you can accelerate the process of decomposition. Because if you are running a business, you know landfills are a business model. I hope you understand this. There is a big money at stake. So, I cannot leave something to degrade or decompose over 20 years because my money gets locked for 20 years. What I wanted is it should get degraded tomorrow morning. Why? So, the more and more space I create, the more and more waste comes, the more and more money I generate like this. So, people are trying to find out a solution so that the entire thing can be degraded fast. So, a lot of research is going on in this area, very interesting area to work on, interdisciplinary, where you can contribute a lot. Another good example of non-degradable hazardous, not hazardous, MSW would be coconut shells. They do not disintegrate at all, fine. Any type of fiber, uh, you are talking about fiber is correct, but not in that sense. Most of the fibers do not decompose because they might be a sort of a polymeric chain or it could be carbohydrates which are non easily decomposable or weathered, both types you can have. So, we talk about weathering of carbohydrates also. So, anyway, so this is a very big issue. Think of a paperless society. You need not to write anything on the paper. Then battery, fuel, cell industry is also contributing a lot to this whole list. Oxygen and then you have a solution. What is the solution? It has to be some hydroxide. KOH, NaOH, oxygen, hydrogen, you pass, there will be two electrodes, you fill the, what you call it as a source solution and then you, this is basically your uh, fuel cell, is it not? A spent material, how to dispose it, what to do with it is a big question. In most of the industries, another issue is the sludge which comes out might be having very high concentrations of salts, chloride concentration, very high concentration. So, what you are going to do with it? How are you going to take, how, what, what type of precautions and processes you are going to adopt so that you can crystallize all the salt which is present into it? I think you must have realized that more than civil engineering, now we talk about the process and materials. So, this point onwards I realize civil engineering gets merged into material science. So, all of them are hazardous waste, where they are located and how you are going to tackle is a big issue. This table gives you a bit idea about what are the heavy metals which are present in different types of waste. So, all of you must be aware of this lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, tin, zinc, chromium, copper, beryllium, is it not? This whole series is strontium. Now, there are few examples of uh, where you would find what metal in more concentration. So, lead is dioxin, any type of poisonous material, gases. There was a ban on toys from China few years back. There was a warning, is it not? They do not allow your kids to play with Chinese toys because kids have a tendency to put in their mouth. 
and this is an easy pathway of dioxins entering into your blood vessels. Shoes, you will be surprised to know that the soles which you are using as a very cushioned shoes, they might be having higher chains of chlorides, PVCs and they are a very good source of inducing osmosis in your blood vessels through your feet. These are the issues. Then mercury is in DDT and then arsenic is a capon is a chemical which is used mostly in different type of insecticides, fertilizers. Cadmium, Mirex is also a chemical. Most of the PCBs which you have tin, carbon tetrachloride, zinc, benzene, chloroform, different type of PVCs, polyvinyl chlorides. So, a lot of studies have to be done when you are handling with MSWs, it is an interesting issue. So, I will share now with you my experiences. Uh, this was a big interesting project I did long, long back. How many of you have been to Korba? Why Korba is famous? NTPC, what is NTPC? Do not tell me what is NTPC, <laughs> you are not aware of NTPC. Sorry? National Thermal Power Corporation, they have the biggest establishment at Korba. Why? So, Korba is about 150 kilometers from Raipur, and this is the hub of the coal mines. So, they have the biggest establishment at Korba. Most of the electricity is produced there. Fine. So, this is how it looks like. These are the four units of the Korba thermal power plant. What else comes to your mind? What else you can see? And there is a water body. Clear? And of course, minus the air pollution, you see there is a lot of pollution in the water body itself. Now, what is the observation here about this picture? What is so peculiar which I want to show you? Can you see a railway track and train moving on it? Concentrate a bit, there is a railway engine, clear? So, on this bridge there is a railway engine. Apart from this, what do you see? Which is what I want to show you and the discussion is all about that. Eutrophication and train is carrying fine. Apart from that, apart from that, what is the major feature? I am a geotechnologist. I am not interested in any of these, whatever you have listed. <laughs> Stability of the pillars, uh, basically a concrete technology, structural people will talk soil around, okay, fine. I am not interested in that. Apart from that, geo environmental issue. And what is so peculiar about this hill? It is flat on the very good, and something else. I have taken this photograph at least from a distance of 2 kilometers. And I am matching something with something. Huh? Yes, you are right, very close. Yes. So, make a story out of it. Yes, you are right. He is a good detective. <laughs> so, now you have solved the problem. So, look at this. There is a mound. Raipur is a flat area. Clear? There are mining operations which are going on. So, you are right, absolutely. This is the waste pile, one of the piles. Please go to Raipur whenever you get time, not to Raipur, Korba, all right. And yes, you are right. The whole idea of taking this photograph was that the bridge top is matching exactly with the height of this from a distance of about 2 kilometers. What is the height of this mound? You are a civil engineer, tell me quickly. Yes, correct. What will be the height of the truss? Of, of the mound, yeah, you are right, this is about 40, 45 meters high mounds. So my question was the truss height actually, I wanted to first know 
But anyway, he has given the answer. So these mounds are 40, 45 meter high. Clear? This is one of the mounds. So this is the main issue. So the more and more mining you are doing, the more and more such type of mounds are getting created. Closer look. These are not landfills. Population is not there at all, except for the NTPC colony. So this is how they contain the residues of the coal. Uh, this is a sport, maybe temporary retaining wall, uh, gabion sort of a thing, and they just mount it, uh, pile it up. So now, what is the source of the problem? This material comes out of the washeries. Washeries are the place where coal is washed. So this is the reality. Uh, these are the residues of the coal which cannot be used for any industrial application. Why? Sorry, very good. So calorific value is extremely poor. Fine. I hope you are getting a feel of there is a dozer here and what dozer is doing? It is trying to make a road so that the trucks come and again dump the next load of this. Look at the height top of this and the top of the dozer. It is at least 10 to 15 meter dif uh, difference. So the biggest problem is the more and more coal which you are excavating out of the open cast mine, you have to process it, you have to wash it and washing is normally done with I think I discussed this long, long back. Mostly it is done with acid, you are right. Which acid? Correct. H2SO4, yes, why? HCl could also be acid. What coal will have? Sulfur. Clear? So, if you want to dissolve sulfur, it has to be dissolved in sulfuric acid only. Sulfur cannot be dissolved in chlorides. So, what you do is you basically use sulfuric acid to dissolve impurities present in the coal. This is what is known as coal washing. Now, what is going to happen when you are washing coal with sulfuric acid? What do you expect? The sludge will come out. Clear? And now the question is where to dispose the sludge, number one. And I was asking you a question, why you are producing this much of the coal washery residues? Because sometimes when you are dealing with anthracite coal or hard coal, calorific value is extremely less and there is no buyer in the market. <clears throat> what is this? Any idea? Can you recognize these features in the background? What we discussed 5 minutes back. So these are the mounds of the coal residues. What is going on here? It is a mining process. This is an open cast mine. Fine. So look at this. This portion from here to here, the coal seam starts at about 4 to 5 meter depth. So this is all soil. On the top of the soil, you have vegetation. Now this is what is known as 4 to 5 meter thick soil has to be removed in the entire area of the mine. Typically these mines would be uh, 5, meet, 5 kilometer by 1 kilometer, 2 kilometer typically. So imagine the volume of the material which you are going to produce and this becomes your overburden. So this has to be displaced first. All right, so this is the mining process which is going on. Now you can see the clay seams very clearly. It's okay. Can you see the clay seams? Oh, sorry, not clay, coal seams. So these are the coal seams, you know, benches are there. So you always make benches and then you keep on digging out the material. Now the biggest concern is that the water which gets accumulated over here, this could be because of uh, low water table or this could be because of this could be because of the river which is nearby, whatever. 
So ultimately this is going to percolate into the base or the subsurface. This is how they dump the overburden material. So overburden is always going to be in a very dense phase, permeability is going to be low, rainwater cannot enter into it. That was a missing link in your thought, you understand? So natural deposits, they have got consolidated over a period of time, they are dense. So the entire rainwater is not going to enter into it. Permeabilities are going to be extremely low, 10 power minus 5, 10 power minus 6, 10 power minus 11 meter per second depending upon the material which you are having. But once you have removed it, it is directly in contact with the, with the coal seams and coal seams will be having all sorts of contamination into it, clear? Mostly sulphur and that is how the acid mine then starts. Is this okay now? Okay. So this is how they dump uh, the overburden, you know. So what has happened now? What are the social issues? You are doing mining somewhere. What is the analysis of this problem? Is this a very happy situation or not? Why not? What is the problem? Sorry? Lack of space, number one. Number two, where these dumps are sitting? In the lands, agricultural land. What these poor guys are going to do? You understand? So you have basically displaced them. So for doing a certain x square area of mining, you require another y square area of the land to keep the overburden, which is going to be displaced from there after 25 years. So one generation is gone, they will become homeless, they will become jobless. You are understanding the issues? Because then only you are going to do the filling once you have extracted the entire thing. Coal is a sedimentary deposit, very nice. So where it is going to be? Close to the water bodies, mostly river, clear. And these lands are going to be highly vegetative. Coal is organic matter. So wherever you have coal seam, the soil is going to be highly vegetative, remember. Otherwise you can't have coal in the barren land, there you will be having zinc copper like in Rajasthan. Wherever you have barren lands, you have more of zinc, copper and all those things. So this problem I was involved with, look at this, this is a beautiful view of what coal washes are. So there is a cutter unit, you know, which keeps on cutting, excavation is going on, processing of the coal is going on and so on. And these are the residues which have been stacked over here. These residues by virtue of being organic matter may catch fire and they may generate methane gas. Now this gives you a clear picture of what the problem is. So this is the first tier of the coal residues where the height would be at least 9 to 10 meters. Now this is where the dozer was plying where I showed you, it is a road which is getting formed and then you will have a next slide of the dump. So there is no clue what, look at the vegetation, it is very vegetative land and then you have no idea that what should be done with this coal wash tree residues. The more and more rains occur, the entire thing will start leaching out different type of contaminants, clear? So that you have to take care of. And another question is, what should I do with this material? There, nobody is going to buy this. Calorific value is zero. This is a beautiful picture. Yes, please. Appreciate this picture first. Appreciate it. It says a lot. What you are observing here? This is the first tire, the second tire, and then I do not know how many tires will be there. Uh, is this a stable slope? Now this is where the slope stability gets linked with this problem. Social issues we have talked about, leachability issues we have talked about, clear? Economics we have talked about, chemistry we have talked about, now comes the stability of slopes. Ignitability we have talked about. So the moment it catches fire, what is going to happen? The entire slope will become unstable. So many times these systems catch fire and then this becomes a very big problem how to control the fire on this. So you have a complete sprinkler system and all those things installed on the top of this. So this is how, you know, different 
stages are done so that you can store as much as possible. <coughs> now this is a beautiful view of how to sum up the entire story. So you have these mounds in the background which are man-made mountains. Earthquake will come, what will happen? Nobody knows. These are big boulders which have been just piled up there. In case of any movement of earth, these things will liquefy, they may lose their entity and they may fall, collapse, loss to property and fall. And then this is the problem which I am talking about. This is a typical coal washery and you have different types of coal which is lying over here. Now the question was that what you can do with this material? Applications. What comes to your mind? What you would have done? I hope you can realize this is not a very heavily rehabilitated area. So roads are not required much. So these type of problems normally are forced on you and you are supposed to solve. You study, you do whatever you want to do, analysis and then give them a solution. So what you will, you can do with this material? Any idea? Where would you use those aggregates? So it is a, it's a sedimentary material. What will be the crushing strength of this material? But by the way, both of you have hinted on the right thing. You will see that how this was used for same applications in a different manner. So you are not very much off the track. Oh, very good. So he has given 100 percent answer. So as a geotechnologist, the best solution would be use this material as a embankment material. But then what is the big problem? Fire, permeability, lack of compactability. Remember, organic matters cannot be compacted. Clear? So, embankments are otherwise also there, no? So, why you are not happy? Because there is no strength. Anything apart from this which comes to your mind? So, I use this entire material as an embankment for creating railway sidings. And I consumed millions of tons of this material. That was a simple solution. So, compact, you are talking about the road network. Yes, I created a embankment for railways. You are talking about the aggregate. This material goes as an aggregate, but in a special way. That cannot be disclosed. So, that is where the Guru Mantra is, you know. So, then you have to do something to create that type of aggregate. So this is the situation. So what I did is I, I tried to create a railway siding so that the movement of the trains up to the mines becomes feasible. And in the process uh, I use about 6 to 10 million tons of the residues from each washery. Yeah, that was an interesting solution. So this is the existing ground level if you see, alright. So it is about 327 and the bottom most point will be 310 meters, so approximately 16 to 7 meter of the filling is required on a stretch of about 2.5 kilometers. So this is the profile which you have to fill up. This is how you synthesize the problem. And then this becomes a typical slope stability problem, fine. So I want to use as much as coal residues as possible buried in the native soil so that there is no direct impact of the railway loading on the material because its crushing strength is low. Another problem is being organic matter it will get decomposed. So the trick is somewhere here how you are going to make a CR bed which is not communicating with the environment at all. Otherwise, organic matter will decompose, fine. So then there is a simple slope stability analysis which you have been doing. Try to maximize the volume of CR which you are going to consume and see whether the system is stable or not. So this was the second design which was done and still I was not very happy because I am going to utilize quite a big cushion of native soil. Fine. So I created berm and all what not and then you do the slope stability analysis and show that everything is fine. 
this was the best solution where I could consume most of the volume of the material. So these type of simple solution like nowhere there is a complication. I hope you can realize this. Simple concepts of geomechanics, understanding of the material and then designing whatever you want to design. So I did lot of tests on coal residues and then I was talking about this aggregate, you know, durability. I defined a term. Then in flakiness index which you talk about, the coal is not flaky, these are lumps. So how would you interlock lumps is a big question. So then we devised lot of techniques and that is what engineering is, that is what technology is, for that you charge your client. Is this fine? And then do monitoring later on that nothing is settling down, nothing is collapsing. I showed you monitoring techniques by putting dial gauges, sorry settlement gauges, pore pressure measurement, deflection of the embankments and so on. So this becomes an interesting case which should be studied. Around 18 years are over, more than that 21 years and this system is working absolutely all right. And then what happens is they replicate them all these things. So this has become a beautiful example of synergetic solution for most of the mining operations and people are happy with this.